first thing I should tell you is that um, this entire presentation, hyperlinks and everything, is up on, on the internet at that link. And somebody's passing out cards. Who has the cards now? So um, if you didn't get a card, maybe if you just raise your hand and get those to you. On the back of those cards is the hyperlink, that one right there. Okay? So just follow that link and you can see exactly what we're seeing right now. So there's no need to um, frantically scribble down URLs or anything like that. You can get to them all afterwards, and there's way too many to scribble down in this presentation. Okay? So I'd like to just kind of briefly start by telling you where I began. Um, this was my first computer. You may recognize it. It's a TI-99-4A. Very incredible graphics. This is what math looked like on a computer in 1984. It's all menu-driven, number-driven. Uh, you chose, you know, every everything you wanted to do by menus, um, and you know you got these incredible motivational rewards for doing that. Well. <laughs> uh, fast forward to when I was in college, and um, I started to learn how to use a graphing calculator technology. This was a, some of you may recognize this. Anyone know what this one is? HP 48G. Right, that was my 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 best friend when I was a chemistry major. All that reverse Polish notation. We learned how to use things like MathCAD. Um, we started to use spreadsheets in our chemistry courses. And then in grad school, I had to give up my beloved HP to learn how to teach with TI calculators. So, um, so that's kind of my history. And uh, I'd like to fast forward that to today. Okay? The technology we have today is so incredibly leaps and bounds ahead of what we started with that I think it's important to remember what we started with. If at some point along the path you said you got frustrated with the technology and said to yourself, this technology is not good for teaching math, and you dropped off the, the, the picture with regards to technology, now would be the time to come back in, because there's never been such great technology here. So um, buckle up, because this is going to be a very fast presentation. It's mostly images, and, um, and we're going to cover a lot of material in a very short amount of time, 50 minutes. So here we go. Um, first thing you have to know is that the base of a technology course, every technology course I've built starts like that. Okay? There's nothing there. So if you feel like you're starting with nothing, that's how I start every course too. The first thing I do for any course, and I think this is very important so that you know where to put the technology, is you build some kind of shell for it. Every one of you has an online um, platform at your college, whether it's Moodle, Blackboard, um, any of those, uh, Sakai, I think some, some of the schools in Michigan are using Sakai. So this is what my um, Calc 1 course looks like. This is what my Calc 2 course looks like. This is what my Math for Elementary Teachers class looks like. You'll notice that they have some common themes. There's always a banner, button colors match the banner. I mostly do that for myself because, and, and for the students too, I think it's good to be able to have a different feel to each course that you don't accidentally put up announcements in the wrong courses and things like that. Um, even though the courses are different, the foundation for every course is exactly the same, and I organize around the topics that are taught in the course. And that's, generally speaking, kind of the outline of, that the textbook follows that you use for the course. Math is, we teach in a fairly linear manner, um, and so that's a fairly easy thing to do. So I start by organizing by topic, and I would never write just chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I always list what the topics are, what the objectives are for each topic, so that I can easily find things in my online shell. It's very hard for me to think, oh yeah, that was chapter five, week two. So I always organize that topic. Once you dive into one of those folders, you see more specific sections, and you'll see for each of those sections, learning objectives for that section. But this does two things that makes your administrators extremely happy, because they're always telling you that you should have learning objectives right up front, you know, where the students can see them. So there they are, they're right up front where the students can see them. But most importantly, it helps me figure out exactly which folder I would put something in as I find it. So when I find some great new interactive applet I want to use in my course, I can just drill right down to the folder I know it goes into. So this is all gets built before the semester starts, just a folder system. And when you get all the way down into that folder, that's what it looks like. The beginning of the semester, the folders are empty. Okay? So during the semester, I just continue to add stuff to the folders. Now I should tell you I do this for both online classes and regular face-to-face -face classes. Every class I teach, I now do this for. Figuring that well, the likelihood that it eventually goes hybrid or online is probably fairly good at this point, and so then when that happens, I have a complete set of materials ready to go. So this is what it might look like towards the end of the semester. Um, it'll have some 
assignments for the students at the very top of the folder. Uh, some links to some of the materials we went over in class. In this case, we, this was a, a section on Venn diagrams. And I taught the Venn diagram section using a whole lot of cartoons I found on the internet. So those are all links to those cartoons. There's one of them, which I think you'll enjoy. I'll give you a second to read that. <laughs> Venn diagrams make a lot of sense to students when you can put it in a context that makes sense to them. So we talk about, for example, who would go in that little, you know, football-shaped region, lives in a remote location, often discussed but rarely seen, but not Santa or Bin Laden, you know. And um, for a couple years there, that would have been Dick Cheney. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, you know, we talk about what goes in all of the little regions, and they brainstorm ideas, and they totally get then how Venn diagrams classify information. They understand the intersections. They understand the subsets and the disjoint sets and all of those things. And it's done all through cartoons which they have access to on that, um, at the, in that course shell right there. Um, I find applets on the internet, so there are various Venn diagram applets that you can use to teach this. Um, and really it's just a matter of looking. Put up some of my own materials, so if you have your own worksheets or handouts or sets of notes, you can put those in your course shell as well. Um, I put links to little videos, so if I record the solutions to something or I record something live in class, I put the links to those videos right in the course show. So at the end of the semester, oh, that's one of the videos right there, just a screenshot from it. At the end of the semester, so there's the beginning, there's the end. Right? That's just what I accumulate in the process of being a good teacher, of going out and saying, what can I find about this topic? It's like preparing lecture notes, only it's in a digital form. Every course show that I build is a work in progress. So every semester they get a little bit richer. I've been building a calculus shell now for about eight semesters, and you can imagine there is a lot of stuff there now. Enough stuff that I, I, I have a textbook optional policy in calculus now, because there's so much material in the course shell that the textbook really isn't necessary. So in the beginning, uh, one of the foundational pieces that I think you need to have if you're going to use digital materials is a robust course shell, and you need to start working on those. You can work on those in groups, individually, whatever. But now we need to free up some time, because all this digital materials, it takes some time. And you all know that we don't have a lot of time to cover everything we need to cover in our classes. So the, one of the ways I free up time is to use algorithmically generated problems, some kind of online homework system to move the content work outside of the classroom. So um, our, our online homework systems now are fairly robust. They're easy to use. They um, have. Uh, math palettes, math equation palettes, so that you can input the mathematics the same way you would see it on paper. So you can use fraction bars, uh, exponents, square roots, all that sort of stuff. It gets inputted into the screen. You can submit your answers and see if they're right or wrong. I think that this ties directly into our students. Uh, if you're not aware, the, the recent Pew, uh, Pew Institute survey about 12 to 17 year olds says that 99% of boys play video games. 94% of girls in that age range play video games. Just imagine when 100% of our students are growing up with this kind of interaction. They've got to have some of that interaction with the material we're trying to teach them. And so I'm basically just trying to tap into their quest for points. I'll leave the statistics open in the, um, in the shell so that or in the online homework system so that they can see how many students got 100%. Because it tends to be that if they can see that other students got 100%, they'll keep working until they get 100%. You know, they don't know who got 100%, but they know that somebody did. So I'm, I'm trying here to tap into the video game culture a little bit and um, move <coughs> homework grading out away from me. I think you're probably all aware that the likelihood that students do homework if you don't grade it is fairly low. Is this a common phenomenon? Okay. So online homework I'm basically just using for one reason, and that's to encourage learning the content outside of class. It is, um, to some extent, a little bit of a necessary evil, but it's one that we have to live with in the, in the world we live in today. Students have so much competing for their attention that we have to compete for that attention, too. So a little bit of a confession. I put it in small print there. It's kind of poetical for math instructors. Can you guys read it in the back now? It's like an eye, eye exam. <laughs> We don't go over homework in class anymore. I absolutely refuse to go over homework in class now. This is what we do in class now. This is my calculus classroom. We have whiteboards on three walls of the room. 
and we spend the majority of time in class with the students working problems. And this allows me to stand on one end of the room and see everybody in the classroom. Um, they work in partners so that they can help each other. Uh, I can just keep reading them problems or, or giving them some kind of handout with problems and walking around and checking their notation and troubleshooting because what I can do in the classroom that's very, very important is I can get at the, the problems in their thinking. If I just stand and talk at them, I can't do that. Right? So I've decided that what needs to happen in the classroom is is this really vital interaction, students teaching each other, because we all know the best way to learn something is to teach it to somebody. So students teaching each other. I should tell you that um, there's a method to this, I think that works very well. Every two problems, one, every other person moves to the right. So every two problems they have a new pair. So it doesn't really matter who they start with, they only get to work for them for, with them for a few minutes and then they're on to the next group. This keeps any group from being dysfunctional for too long. <laughs> And everybody stays nice to everybody else because they're going to be your partner soon enough. You, you better, you know, get along. But I love seeing scenes like this with students pointing out the mathematics to each other. Um, I love being able to do things like have my calculus students map out series tests on the boards. You know, so they spent a good half an hour one day looking at all the different tests and trying to figure out um, how they all connect with each other and which to use first and which, you know, which result and which. Um, answers. There's a little bit closer view of that. And you can see they get quite complex. And um, you might ask, well, what if they want to take that home with them? Somebody asked that. Please ask. Oh, what if they want to take it home with them? What if they want to take it home with them? <laughs> well, you know, they have these little devices they carry around. Maybe you've seen them. They're in their pockets. And they have cameras on them. You've seen these things? So they just pull out the camera and take a picture of anything they want to keep. So whether it's a problem they work, they think, oh, I want to make sure I remember that one, that one was really tough. They're always just pulling out their cell phones and taking pictures of them. They'll text them to each other. You know, uh, it, it, they work quite well for that. Um, we're, if this is a classroom setup that you'd like to have, there's a post on my website about building a classroom like this. Um, we're actually trying to get a new set of tables for our classroom. Um, we're calling them Math Elites, which is um, Engaged Learning Interactive Technology Environment. So um, you can check that out if you look at the link and all the pedagogical reasons for everything in the room are listed there. So the second thing I think we need to do is remove ourselves from the shackles of content. We need to have that flexibility in class to be able to engage with students in a way that makes the class time very valuable to them. So the next thing I do is I give students a place to collaborate and discuss and ask questions of each other. And the place I give them is discussion boards. So this is where we address the homework questions. And the discussion boards every semester are very used and very vibrant. They always look something like this. All of these topics here, those are student generated. I have not written that many discussion questions. I let the students pose every question on the discussion board and all of the answers. So again, just hundreds of topics during the semester. We're going to dive in here to one of the sections. This is uh, derivatives. So this is inside that section, that's the, the list of all the topics, and you can see that with every topic um, it has a variety of posts <coughs> along here. Often in math there's just two posts, right? Somebody poses a question they're having trouble with, somebody gives them a hint, that's the end, right? Math discussion boards look nothing like discussion boards in English, and I don't think we should try to make them look that way. My discussion boards have a lot more threads and a lot less posts per thread. But that doesn't make them any less valuable to the students who go and try to get help with problems. You know, somebody asks the question, somebody answers it, and then 30 other students go to read it, right? So the discussion boards have everything from graphs to handwriting uh, to little screenshots of problems. Um, and I try to leave it mostly up to the students to interact with each other, and I, I'll just jump in if nobody else can come up with anything good to say. There are two secrets to having successful discussion boards. The first, secret, the first secret is to take every question you get and remind students that they could have put it on the discussion board. So whether that is a question they ask after class, a question before class, a question in your office, I always say, you know, why didn't you put that on the discussion board? You could have had an answer last night. You know? um, as far as questions sent by email, as long as they're general questions, I will actually take that question, put it on the discussion board, answer it on the discussion board, and then email the student back and say the answer's on the discussion board. They very quickly learn that the place to put the questions is the discussion board because they will get the answer much quicker that way. Other students will answer them. The second secret to discussion boards is 
um, quite frankly, to do something having to do with points with them. And I choose to not have it be mandatory points. Um, mine are optional points. They can have up to five extra credit points on a test. We all know that you can make a test five points harder, right? <laughs> so we shouldn't be too worried about this. If you're worried that you're you know, over, over giving points, then just make your test a little harder and it'll all be okay. Um, so they can earn up to five extra credit points for posting questions or answers or help on discussion boards. They can't just say something like a awesome, you know, but they have to contribute something substantially. So they can contribute five times, they can contribute 25 times, they still just get five points. Um, but that encourages a lot of the students to, to go out there and try it the first time because they know they're getting something for it. And you know what's funny is it always turns out that the students who are using the discussion board are the A and B students. And then occasionally a student who's really struggling and right on the edge of a C is getting a lot of help from those students. And that's great. That's exactly what it would want to happen. So another piece to this puzzle, I think, is to utilize something where students can share with each other. Okay, so now we've got to give students some tools that allow them to communicate a little bit easier. We know it's not easy to communicate mathematics. It's really not easy to do it on the internet, but today it is actually pretty easy. Because if you can get the math to your screen, then you can share it. And there's lots of ways to get the math to your computer screen. You can use a digital camera. You can use a cell phone. Even my iPod now has a video camera on it. <coughs> right? So we can take pictures or videos. Copiers will allow you to scan right to email. Um, we have, some of the students have digital pens now. We have scan, a lot of them have scanners at home. They have all sorts of ways to get the math to the internet. And there's no reason why you have to require one specific way. You just have to say, use one of these things to find a way. And let them. Because once they get it to their computer screen, they can use a program called Jing. This is a program that is absolutely free, first of all. And I should tell you that all the programs I'm mentioning here, I, I'm getting no kickbacks whatsoever from any of them. These are just the programs I use. As a matter of fact, some of them I pay for. Depends on the program. But Jing is one that's absolutely free. And here's the types of things that let students do. All of these little images you saw on my discussion boards, those are all inserted by students using Jing, which allows them to take just tiny little screen captures, or big screen captures, or annotated screen captures of whatever they can see on their screen. So they insert handwritten work. They insert mathematics that they can do with either um, LaTeX or with MathType or with the equation editor. It doesn't really matter because what they're doing is taking an image of it once it's done. So you'll see a variety of, of types of input, but all put in with images. I like this one because it has a spiral bind on the side, which I think is quite cute. <coughs> graphs from programs on the internet, we can get those in. All of those are simply taking a jing of it and then dropping it into the discussion board. I'm going to show you also uh, some images from student assignments. Most of my students submit their work digitally. There's a secret to that. Um, they submit their work digitally because they get 12 more hours to do it if they submit it digitally. So if they want to submit it by hand, that's fine. It's due at noon on Friday. That's so that my secretary or colleague can drop it onto the copier for me and scan it to me, um, or if I'm there. Uh, but if they will do me the favor of submitting it digitally, then they get till midnight. Because then it doesn't matter to me. I'm probably not going to grade them till the next day anyways. So that gets me about 36 out of 38 students submitting things to me digitally. <laughs> it's very clever. It's a good carrot. So if you want to get things digitally, I highly recommend just giving them a few extra hours if you do it that way. And uh, you can see a variety of, of ways they're submitting. A few of these that are on the screen here, this one in the lower uh, right-hand corner, that's with a digital pen um, for the question that was asked. And there is one on here. I should go back a second to this. You see the one in the upper right? Anyone recognize how they're, how they're putting that one in? That's a whiteboard. We do so much whiteboard work in class that some of the students will go home and put a whiteboard on the room of their on the wall of their room. And so this student has gotten in the habit of working out her problems on a whiteboard and then taking pictures of it to submit them. Pretty clever, huh? There's something about whiteboards that just make them very enticing to students. It's like them taking control of the classroom, I think. So they use all sorts of methods to capture those images, and once they get them to their screen, they just use Jane to put them in. Um, you can also, with Jing, share videos, which means that I can share a short video or students can share a short video with me. So I have several examples here, and again, if you follow the URLs later on, you can see the videos. 
Um, but the, the basic concept is you have up to five minutes, no editing, so you just record what you're going to record, and that's that. But once you're done recording them, there's a button you can hit on Jing that just sends it directly to the internet and gives you a hyperlink. So you don't have to exchange large files with each other, you just have to send somebody the link. They click on the link and it opens directly from the internet. So all sorts of videos there. Um, student assignments, I often will give, in my online classes, I'll give students an assignment like, explain to me you know, what, how you find the sign of you know, 2 pi over 3 or something like that. And they'll have to make a short video to explain it, which is when you're grateful that there's only five minutes allowed. Okay? But they come up with all sorts of creative ways. This person made this little type, this nice type to demonstration, and, and this one uh, drew a triangle and just used their mouse over their handwritten work to explain different parts of it. These students both gave me permission to share theirs, and so you can go watch those as well. Uh, students also will record live in class. If we're going around the room and we're doing problems on the board and there's one that's particularly difficult, they can come up and use my computer to record it and it'll go online for all the students to use. So that's an example of that you can watch. And I should just point out one more time that that's free. Right? And it'll only take you about five minutes to learn how to use it. Okay? Several of you in here, raise your hand if you are using Jing right now. Several of you here, and does it take more than five minutes? No, it really doesn't. So this does work on PCs and it works on Macs. So it's no longer the software or the specific hardware that's important here. As long as you can get it to your computer screen somehow, you can share it. Okay, another thing that we should be using is virtual models. There are a ton, and I mean a ton, of virtual models we can be using. I'm just going to show you some images from a few of them. Um, this is the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. And it has this lovely little balance thing where you can balance equations and show adding and subtracting from both sides or dividing, multiplying by both sides. It's got fraction um, manipulatives, it's got base blocks manipulatives, base five block manipulatives, color counter manipulatives. If you teach pre-algebra through algebra, you will find this site really, really useful. All sorts of stuff in there. If you, however, teach higher than that, this is another site you will find useful. Algebra instructors will find it useful too, but I think the level of this increases a little bit. This is the Wolfram Demonstrations Project. But let's just have a, um, a little poll here, okay? We'll do something active for a second. Stand up if you've heard of the Wolfram Demonstrations Project. Okay, stay standing if you've used the Wolfram Demonstrations Project with students. <laughs> I tried. I couldn't make it work. Excellent. Good for you guys. <laughs> this is what we call a knowledge add to practice gap. You have knowledge of something. You might even have a favorable attitude towards it, but you're not using it. This is what my dissertation research is about, by the way. Knowledge add to practice gaps. So the Wolfram Demonstrations Project has all sorts of little applets you can use that demonstrate a whole lot of things. There are now over 6,000 demonstrations on there. Right, this has been around since 2007. Okay? 6,000 demonstrations, all sorts of stuff. With, we talked yesterday a lot about getting real-world applications into the classroom. You know, about 4,000 of those demonstrations are straight math, and about 2,000 are applications of math, like this one on traffic congestion. Um, some of the word problems, the classic word problems we have in math, can be found there. Um, just kind of standard. Uh, problems of relating functions to their derivatives, integrals, limits, etc. Trigonometry. Um, I would highly encourage you to check that out. The only thing you need to run these is the free Mathematica player. You do not need to purchase anything. We have the Mathematica player just installed on all of our campus computers, so that's usable by students. We also have Jing installed on all of our campus computers. The NSF sponsors several um, projects that are, also have great applets you can use. This is Paul Seberger's project on multivariable calculus. If you teach multivariable calculus and you're not using these things, you should definitely check them out. Demos with Positive Impact is an older NSF-sponsored grant, but they have the best collection of um, volumes of rotation and volumes by slicing and uh, quite a few related rates problems on there. So if you teach any of those things, you should check them out. Also, David is really I was looking for something new to program, so if there's something he doesn't have that you'd like, you can just kind of nicely ask, and he usually delivers. I have actually a very large collection of these things on the internet at this web address. It's on an interactive map, and that's just one tiny branch of the map opened up, but all of those will send you directly to the site if you just click on the links on the edge. 
that's like a three hour presentation in itself. Okay, so don't try to do all the programming it's yourself. You don't need to do any of the programming yourself. Chances are, if you can think of some nice application of math, you can find it on Google somewhere. Whether it's Wolfram Demonstrations or NLVM or some professor's website somewhere that has a passion for that. So now, let's talk about CAS. There are uh, plenty of free options for CAS today. There's Sage, Maxima, R Project, um, or in this GeoGebra. These are all free, right? So there's no excuse not to use um, CAS these days. But there is one in particular that I think we need to, and those are all the links, by the way, you can look at them later. But we need to talk about this one. So we're going to do another standing poll. I want you to stand up if you've heard about Wolfram Alpha. Well, you know what? We're doing a good job in Michigan because at some conferences I only get five people. Just now stay standing if you've actually gone and played with Wolfram Alpha. Ooh, even better. We are like way above other states, let me tell you. So stay standing if you've used Wolfram Alpha with your students. Uh-oh. <laughs> See, there it is. There's that cap, right? <laughs> All right, let's give these guys a hand because they are pushing the edge. So we need to talk about this one a little bit. And if you haven't spent a lot of time looking at this, I'm just going to show you a couple screenshots of what it does. So it does some of the kind of boring stuff, you know, like those difference of cubes we talk about. You know, why do we have students factor difference of cubes? I mean, here it is. Put in the difference of cubes and that alternate form there, that's the factored form. You can give it all sorts of natural language input. So you know all those problems in algebra text, find the equation of the line between these two points. Or even in word problems, when the, you know, the points are, represent real data, all you have to do to get the equation now is type line in the two points. And it will give you the graph of the line, the equation of the line in various forms, the x-intercept, the y-intercept, the slope, and, well, the distance between the points, because that's all the things it can think of to do with that. You can give it lists of information. So any kind of data it has in its system, if you give it to it in a list, um, separated by commas, it will compare those things. So you can give it lists of names, you can give it lists of cities, you can give it lists of chemicals, you can give it lists of polygons. It will compare whatever it's got in its system. If you give it a tri the word triangle on the three sides, it will draw the triangle for you and solve the triangle for you. Suddenly, I don't really want to solve triangles the old-fashioned way anymore. It will do some kind of crazy things, like it has um, ancient numeration systems in here. So if you teach math for elementary ed, it will do the Babylonian, the Mayan. It, for some reason, won't do Egyptian yet. I keep trying to get them to do that. But it, it has an abacus rendering, all sorts of things in here. Let's just take a look at uh, graphs for a second. If you give it a function, it will draw you a graph. It usually tries to draw one that shows the end behavior and one that shows kind of the middle behavior of the graph. And tell you what it is, give you alternate forms, give you roots for the graph, give you the derivatives, the integrals, if it has them, maximums, minimums. If it has areas under a curve, it'll give you that as well. Did you see that little thing in the corner there? Show steps. It will also tell you how to take the derivatives, the integrals, how to solve the equations. Now what I want you to notice, I'm going to back up here a second, look at the top input there. There's no semicolons, there's no brackets, there's no special formatting required. There's not even, you know, even graphing calculators, we have to, you have to get to the right screen to tell it what to do. You don't have to do that here, you just tell it what you want it to do, and that's that. Actually, the more of that syntax you put in, the worse it'll go for you. It will also do things like infinite series. So here's an infinite series. It does a nice partial sum plot of it. It tells you what the sum is. It even tells you the results of some of the tests. Anyone ever had trouble getting implicit derivative, implicit graphs plotted with their graphing calculator? Just put it in. There's the graph. There's some alternate forms, the derivatives. I suddenly also no longer want to take second derivatives of implicit functions. Well, implicit graphs, I should say, not functions. It will even do things like if you want to plot multiple graphs, you just separate them by commas, but you don't even have to have explicitly what the second graph is. You can just do something like take the derivative of the first graph, right? And it will plot that. It will plot the function and then the derivative of that function. To share this stuff, all you have to do is 
copy the URL at the top of the page. So at the top of the page there, you can see that, oh, it just made it, okay? So that URL right there, all you have to do is copy that, and the next person who, who opens that will get exactly what you got. Because it's essentially just a search. And the, the language that pulled up your search will pull up the same search for somebody else. Which means that you can share this stuff in chat windows, like Facebook, Google Chat, MySpace. Does anyone use MySpace anymore? Um, th those types of things. Any kind of chat window you can share those in. You can share these things as hyperlinks in your online courses. So this is an example from my Calc course. You know, rather than put in all the graphs of these things, I just put a link behind each of those to the Wolfram Alpha page. Of course, that's dangerous because it means you've now shown your students that Wolfram Alpha exists. Um, you can even share the old-fashioned way. You can just click on these, right-click on these images and go to copy image, go to your document and hit paste. Who likes that? <laughs> okay, that makes it so incredibly easy to create assessments and, and documents of various kinds because it's no longer diff you no longer have to find your calculator and find the cord and connect it to the computer and you know it's just right there. So, anyone excited? Yes. Yeah. yeah? Anyone nervous? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we should be a little bit of both, I think, by this. Um, what I do think we can start to use this for is something that we've had a hard time getting into math for a long time, which is inquiry-based learning. It's always been so difficult to teach students how to use Maple or Mathematica or Sage. There's so much coding that you spend the whole time teaching the coding and, and there, there ends up being no exploration. They just follow the labs, exactly the way the labs are written, and you know, if you put a gun to their head, they would maybe use the program again, but not voluntarily. My students take to this like a duck to water. I mean, it's just incredible. I get my, all the questions they ask me now are more questions like, um, well, I tried this with Wolfram Alpha and I looked at the steps and there was a step I didn't understand. Can you explain that to me? You know, it's shifted the types of questions I get. It's not, can you explain me the whole problem? Can you explain a step to me? And do some students use it for, you know, not so academic reasons? Yes, but we've always had students who did that and they usually find theirs on the test, right? They don't like to spell test them to realize that they need to spend more time studying. Um, but I get so much more from this now. I mean, students, when they go to turn in assignments to me, they include a lot of graphs now. Because all they have to do is copy and paste. There's nothing complicated about it. They learn all sorts of stuff about Wolfram Alpha that they teach me. So they're exploring it on their own. I want to show you one type of assignment I did with it this past semester. Um, I thought, well, with Wolfram Alpha out there, do I really want to focus on the answers for things anymore? No, nah, not so much. The answers are easy to get. And quite honestly, if, I, if you know, the Mars lander or something depended on it, I would rather than do the calculations through some kind of CAS than by hand and have some intuition about them. So what I did was I gave my students a list of 20 integrals. This is before I taught any of the more advanced integration techniques. I gave them a list of 20 integrals, and I showed them how to use Wolfram Alpha to do the integral. You type integrate in the function. It's pretty difficult. Um, and so I had them write down, you know, the answers for all of these integrals. So first step, do 20 integrals. Second step, cut them all apart. Third step, put them into piles based on the answers. Which answers look similar to each other? Once you have them all in piles, then tell me what's similar about the questions. What do those questions, or what do those integrals all have in common? And I said, you know, the assignment was basically, I want you to write statements telling me which ones group together and why. So, you know, when the integrals look like this, you know, the solutions seem to be similar in this way, right? And I was absolutely thrilled with the results I got from this. I mean, I, what I was seeing was that calculus students could actually think. They could recognize patterns, right? And I think that if we teach nothing else in these, these classes, we need to teach students how to be analytic and how to recognize patterns. The technology is advancing so fast, we can't possibly predict what the technology will be like 10 years from now. So you can see, you can read through some of those answers later on. Um, but there's more about this particular assignment. You can download the assignment at that link. So, you no longer have to teach how to use CAS. Just use it. It's there. Another thing that I've been using with my class is a lot of Web 2.0 tools. This is a model for what I do in my math for elementary teachers class. And for, we have four units, and for each unit, the students are broken into four groups. Some of them blog, some of them develop mind maps. Some of them do inquiry-based learning presentations in class, and some of them do digital presentations. And I, I bring this all together using RSS feeds. This is a, 
a net vibes page. And what it does is the, the landing page for this actually pulls in things like um, the math and the news from the MAA, which you can get with an RSS feed, pulls in a couple of blogs that people write out there in the real world about teaching in elementary schools, teaching math in elementary schools. So those things pull in there as well. On the individual tabs here, I have all of the student projects. And so um, what you're seeing there, we're going to get in closer in a second, but you're seeing their RSS feeds and um, links to their digital presentations, links to their mind maps. So I'm going to just very briefly go through a, a couple of the digital presentations that they do. So in this particular case, uh, one of the students built a Prezi to explain counting as a Babylonian. Uh, one of the students uh, did an animo, a couple of them probably did an animo, I don't know, one of them did an animoto, which is, this is a whole other talk. This is like an hour, another hour on just this stuff, but um, some of them do cartoons. Uh, these are their blogs. So uh, again, I'm just pulling in the RSS for their blogs. So all I have to do at the beginning is say, take this RSS. As soon as I've got it set up, everything naturally posts after that. So I'm just going to go quickly through some of their, their blog pages. Just so you can see the kinds of things that they're doing there. I somehow convinced all my students this semester that the metric system is the way to go. I made them measure a whole bunch of objects with rulers in inches and in centimeters, and they decided that inches suck. <laughs> <laughs> so now they're all like raw, raw metric. So they have a lot of fun with this. And the assignment, basically, when they blog, is tell me what you're learning. That's the assignment. It has to have something to do with class, but tell me what you're learning that relates to class. That's all I want to know. And they have, you know, there's a little bit of a requirement, you know, each post has to be two paragraphs, roughly, and things like that. But other than that, it's basically an open-ended assessment. All of their blogs look very individual to them. Uh, they all have different writing styles, but they really enjoy it. Um, they build mind maps. These are interactive mind maps. Um, they're quite complex. <coughs> That's zooming in on one. Um, they, you can go right from their mind maps to the links that they find. So they're going out and looking for their own resources. They're going out and learning that if you want to learn math, you can find all sorts of resources to help you. This one's kind of cute because it's made to look like a plant. And you can see they also have, have notes on those branches where they explain the link they're about to send you to. Um, this particular one, the student decided to find all the fun ways he could to learn math. So that was, that was his goal. He played. He played games for like six or seven hours to build this, you know, all math games. Um, so if you're interested in those types of projects, I do have a web link that, that gives you all of the um, rubrics and all the assignments and links to all of their projects that are out there on the web. So, you know, like I said, that's, that's a whole hour in itself. But it's important to note that we're almost experimenting with some of this Web 2.0 stuff. Um, I've been experimenting a bit lately with Twitter, and there's a whole presentation on that you can go visit. Uh, you may have seen recently um, the Calculus Tweet Wars, which was a recreation of the Calculus Wars on Twitter. So Leibniz and, and Newton uh, duped it out, so to speak, with a whole cast of characters. The best part, I think, was at the end when Ghost of Leibniz finally got to have his say. Um, and oh, you can go read. There's a whole archive of the whole thing you can go read. So I think the important thing about all of those things is, in all of those types of projects, I'm learning from my students. It takes a long time to grade projects, not because they're hard to grade, but because I learn so much that I get distracted by the things they show me. And I go out and play the games, and I go out and look at the sites they find. Another thing we could be using in our classes are embedded videos. Um, I was playing a TED Talk at the very beginning before, as people were walking in, so some of you got to see that. And uh, let's just do one more poll here. Stand up if you've heard of TED Talks. Stay standing if you've used TED Talks in your classes. <laughs> Give them a hand. <laughs> if you haven't seen TED Talks, these are phenomenal. I, I mean, I, can, I just, if I had another hour, I would just show you TED Talks, I think. There are TED Talks that, that make data the most interesting thing you've ever seen in your life. Um, there's TED Talks that explain the relationships between all sorts of things. And, and the beauty is that the presenters often talk about the math as like such a, you know, like, well, obviously it's a logarithmic graph, blah, 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 blah. And it's so great for our students to see that. Um, Text Long Tail by Chris Anderson, that's all about asymptotes and the importance of asymptotes in business. 
I mean, come on, you can't get any better than that. Um, how statistics fool juries. These are all very good speakers with very good presentations, and all that video is embeddable. Um, there's a site called 60 Symbols that goes through all of the symbols used in physics, astronomy, and math, and those are all embeddable videos that look something like that. Embeddable just means you can drop it right into your course shell, and it will run from inside your course shell or your web page. There's a site called Sputnik Observatory for the study of contemporary culture, and there's about 28 videos on there that have to do with math. They're kind of fun topics like um, alien mathematics and uh, the math of C and G tuning forks. There is, of course, a whole <laughs> collection of stuff on YouTube. These are great Easter eggs for your students when they're you know, going through the, the content in your class to run across a little Easter egg like this. Ooh, a video to watch. You can get to watch just about any video because it's more interesting than reading about math. <laughs> Um, so there's some fun ones like uh, Calculus Rhapsody and I Will Derive. There's also a lot of instructional videos on YouTube. A lot of instructional videos on YouTube. Thousands of them in particular. Just doing a quick search. 60,000 on statistics, 40,000 on algebra, 19,000 on calculus, even going down to specific topics. There are 1,800 related rates videos on YouTube. All mostly worked out, you know, problems. So if you need something explained, if you don't understand how radioactivity works, and you'd like a better understanding before you do a problem with your students, go find a video and watch it. Or send your students to watch the video. So the last thing I want to talk about, if you're not shocked by any of this yet, I know there's this Michigan retirement plan going on. I'm afraid that there may be some retirements at the end of this. I hope not. <laughs> I hope you get energized and not. Uh, so if you're not shocked yet, I, I have begun experimenting lately with using games in my classes. I'm going to just send you the three games that I think are particularly good. This one's called Line Gem, and it teaches students the, the, an intuition for the equation of the lines. It's a very simple game. Um, there's a great game called Flower Power. I have, a whole, I have a picture of my entire class playing this game at once. They're totally engrossed in it. I mean, a gorilla could have run through the room and they wouldn't have noticed. But it, it basically teaches them equivalent fractions and the importance of equivalent fractions, which for future elementary teachers, I could ask for nothing more than that they understand why it's important to have common denominators. There's a great game called Factortris, which is just like Tetris. It teaches multiplication skills, finding factor pairs, teaches the idea of area um, for multiplication. And there's a whole, this is again an entire another presentation of a philosophy behind this, and you can actually go watch that whole presentation there. Um, so, fun is when the brain is learning something new. And so I think we ought to have some more games in our classes. So my final thoughts. If this is you, I'm going to ask you to reevaluate. Because if that's you, if what you're spending most of your time doing in the classroom is talking to your students, even if you're having a conversation with one or two students in the room, which is what it turns out it usually is, you're only one step away from that. And it won't take very long before somebody realizes that with those hundreds of thousands of videos on the internet, what's important about having an instructor in the classroom? Now we know there is something important about that, but we need to act it out. And so if you can't compete with the digital world, you can't compete with the video games and the entertainment systems and everything else that our students are doing, then join the digital world and then you'll no longer be in competition with it. So the final piece in this puzzle is you. And so I just want to remind you how you start, because at this point, usually people feel a little bit overwhelmed. That's how you start. Remember that? Everybody starts there. I start there, you start there, we all start there. You just start. So that's it.